right like, cowbell yeah it's okay it's lunch on the last day Oh, you are. Oh, okay. And now we know we have a, an intercom. <laughs> or the fire alarm. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we are at the last but not least session um, of uh, the, our conference, Cosmology and Large Scale Survey. Uh, and we're very exciting, very excited to have Ami Choi uh, telling us about weak lensing with JWST and Roman. All right, thanks, Andrea. And also thanks to the organizers and also the other speakers and attendees for putting together such a lovely conference. I've been learning a lot, um, and it makes me really excited to see uh, the 
continuing emerging results from JWST and thinking about how we will use them in conjunction with Roman data um, and also use them to prepare for Roman. Uh, my talk will be a little bit different from, I think, most of the other talks so far in the sense that, uh, as you will see, weak lensing is really a statistical measurement, um, and so there are, actually aren't that many weak lensing results yet from JWST, although there is at least one, um, and maybe uh, those of you in the audience uh, might be able to tell me if I've missed something. Um, all right, uh, but this is a quick look at my talk, so I'll start by uh, talking about weak lensing and motivating why we want to use it to explore the universe. Uh, I'll also talk about what the current results are, what we're seeing with today's surveys, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we're preparing for measurements with Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, and then I'll talk about the road ahead. Uh, all right, and then you'll see all of these things, so I'll just kind of skip through that. All right, so this is our picture of the universe. It's kind of the obligatory timeline universe in a nutshell plot. And so we're starting over here on the left. Um, and as the universe ages, uh, galaxies and objects, well, first uh, stars and objects um, uh, form and then uh, form into galaxies. And then we have more structure forming. And then we're here on the right-hand side. And all right, so galaxy surveys, um, at least from the ground, are mostly telling us about the late time universe. And so these are structures that formed um, in the last uh, five to 10 billion years. And then we also have information from the cosmic microwave background, which is telling us about the early time universe. So that's one of the snapshots of the universe in its really, really um, infant stages. And of course, uh, with JWST, we're re revealing a lot of the first astronomical objects that are um, in this middle region here. And Roman will also um, explore that region too. It'll really expand what we're learning about the late time universe now um, much further to the left here. Uh, but the overall question that I've been interested in trying to answer um, in the last many years is can we describe the universe, uh, the physics of the universe with a single model that is comprised of dark matter and dark energy, and also with a set of, say, six parameters, uh, which are the same across that entire um, 13 billion, over 13 billion years. All right, so um, here's a, a simulation of the web, the filamentary structure of the universe. And um, so in these uh, peaks, uh, density peaks, we can see galaxies. So they're tracing that structure. Uh, but what we want to learn about is the matter, and we've found out from multiple ob observations that the matter is mostly dark matter. And so we can't really see it directly. So it turns out um, that, uh, so here's another simulation where we see, uh, sorry, uh, where we see the dark matter, and then these blue ellipses here are meant to to illustrate galaxies, and we can see that the galaxies are aligned with this dark matter structure. And so that's already how we can learn um, about that underlying mass structures. All right, now lensing is the particular phenomenon that causes those galaxies to be aligned with the foreground large scale structure. And it's a really subtle effect when we think about weak gravitational lensing. So a lot of you are probably familiar with strong gravitational lensing where we can actually see with their eyes the impact on the images of the galaxies. They're really highly distorted. There might be multiple images and, and so forth. Uh, but with weak lensing, um, it can be something like 0.1 impact on the ellipticity of the galaxy shapes. And then lensing is specifically sensitive to the mass density of the universe and also the amplitude of fluctuations, um, this little sigma eight, which is also combined together with this omega m or the mass density into a parameter called S8, um, which is, is kind of like some amplitude of structure fluctuations. So now this is a schematic of lensing um, on the left here and, oh, All right, so uh, thanks to Pat's talk yesterday, you saw um, a, a diagram of uh, deflection angles, and this is really uh, very much like that, um, but showing us you know, the distant galaxies with the light coming um, towards us. What we're seeing is this projected 2D image here, 
And so these galaxies, um, which were in this uh, illustration originally round, as they go past some um, heavy objects, could be heavy galaxies, groups of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, um, those objects are weighing down space-time, and so that what we actually see is uh, our images where the path of the light traveling from those really distant galaxies have been distorted. And so these galaxies' images um, appear as being kind of stretched, um, and for this case, it's stretched along the, the line of sight relative to the center of uh, where these foreground structures are. So the two important ingredients for weak gravitational lensing um, are shown here. So we need to make me good measurements of the source galaxy shapes, and we also need some understanding of the redshift distributions along the line of sight, both to the objects that are doing the lensing and then the very back, the background galaxies where the light is traveling from. All right, so the shapes of background galaxies, they're aligned with the foreground structure. Cosmic shear, that's specifically a shorthand term for lensing by large-scale structure. Um, and this is usually measured as some sort of correlations of galaxy shapes as a function of separation on the sky. And so there's some, um, we're trying to look for coherent patterns. So in this illustration, these are both kind of aligned in some way um, of pairs of galaxies as a function of, of redshift. All right, so then galaxies also trace the underlying mat matter field, um, mod moduli some quantity called galaxy bias. Trouble with the printer here. Um, all right, so then there's two additional correlations we can look at. So previously I talked about the shape-shape correlations. And we can also correlate positions of galaxies. This is telling us about gal uh, galaxy clustering uh, also as a function of separation. And then finally, we can correlate the position, positions of foreground galaxies with background galaxy shapes. And this is known as galaxy-galaxy lensing for shorthand. And now we can think about um, all the galaxy surveys that have been designed for cosmic shear. Um, and at the end, I'll, I'll talk about some other results that are not on the main part of the, the, the plot. But starting with the first detections of cosmic shear um, in 2000, so it was over 20 years ago. Um, and then there were several surveys, um, it's sort of in the mid 2000s, um, past uh, going well into the 2010s. And then we are, um, okay, uh, uh, here with the Hypersu Prime Cam the Dark Energy Survey and the Kilodegree Survey, all of which had finished their operation several years ago, but they're currently under, um, undertaking their final analysis of their full data sets. Um, and so that's still happening now, so stay tuned. Um, but that's really the last stop, at least from the, the ground-based perspective, up until we get Euclid, which is launching in um, a matter of weeks. So it's about two weeks from now it's going to launch. Uh, then also the Vera Rubin Legacy Survey of Space and Time, and this number is actually slightly off, so uh, it's actually going to start in 2025. I think first light will be toward the later part of 2024, um, and that will run for 10 years. And then, of course, Roman, as you've heard, will launch um, somewhere between October 2026 and May of 2027, and then that will have a nominal five-year mission, but we're hoping that it will last for at least 10. Now, I said I'd, I'd mention a little bit about um, SGSS and HST up here. So SGSS, of course, ground-based, but a really large fraction of the sky, um, kind of shallow and clearly not designed for lensing in terms of the, the image resolution, but um, did still produce uh, very important results for cosmic shear. And also, um, there were some HST surveys. I think the first one was the GEM survey back in um, kind of 2005, uh, about there. Um, and then, as you probably are familiar with, Cosmos also had a number of important cosmic shear results. Um, so these are kind of you know, precursors to what JWST will show us with Cosmos Web. Um, and so that's something that I was uh, super excited to hear about from Caitlin's talk yesterday and looking forward to further results there. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention here is that the size of the teams ha have really been growing uh, as the error bar decreases. And this is something that we need to think about in terms of how we operate together in these, these large collaborations. 
All right, so going into the current landscape. Um, all right, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because there's, there's quite a lot. Um, but I did want to give you an overview of how, how do we go from the images to actually getting these um, funny looking contour plots at the end here, uh, some of which, this, this one is not a banana, but some of you might be familiar with this kind of common banana shape where we have um, the matter density on the x-axis and then the um, sigma eight, uh, little sigma eight on the y-axis. So there's this very um, classic degeneracy that's kind of elongated along this direction. Um, but this is, since this S8 is, combi is a combined parameter, it, it looks a little bit different. Um, but there, there's quite a lot going into these. Um, there's a lot of processing go that goes on, even kind of like in between some of the steps that I have here. Uh, but just to, to highlight, some of the very important steps are to uh, correct, to accurately characterize the point spread function, to measure galaxy shapes, uh, to figure out your redshift distributions and calibrate them, um, you'll probably want to do a lot of simulations where you're testing your algorithms for shape measurement, testing, you know, what happens when your objects are blended, like what kind of systematic that um, imparts to your analysis. And then you're making measurements of some of those correlation functions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's a huge uh, effort also going into modeling and analysis. So that part is also, um, I, I would say each of these kind of um, are different chunks um, so I've kind of delineated that here, and it's just very uh, large, hardworking teams over many years that create the, um, the results for each of these, these areas. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the modeling and analysis choices for some recent work that we just finished. Um, and then at the very end of it, you run a um, sampling over the likelihood, and you get some sort of parameter plot that looks like this. And another thing I'll mention is that we've been trying to mitigate experimenter bias or what, what people st uh, commonly call blinding, where there are different levels of um, blinding or obscuration uh, where we're trying to make sure that we're no, you know, we know what Planck found, we know what other large scale structure surveys found. We're not, we don't want to unintentionally make choices that lead to exactly that same answer. And so there's some layers here where we try to make sure that we can at least try to mitigate that, that experimenter bias. All right, so I'll talk about uh, briefly about one of the very recent results that we just wrapped up um, several weeks ago um, between, so this is a collaboration between two um, cosmic shear, two of the cosmic shear surveys that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm a member of both, uh, Alex Amon's a member of both, and there's a team here that, um, this is the core team, I would say that, actual team that was necessary to produce this result is really huge. It doesn't even, it goes beyond um, the names that are on this plot or on this slide. Um, but yeah, these were the, the main contributors. So Anna Porodon, Simon Samaroff, Marika Asgari, and Catherine Hamans. Um, and we wanted to see what happens when you combine the latest results from the kids survey, the kilodegree survey, and then the dark energy survey, their most recent results. And just to say uh, some brief words about what the, where the surveys are in the sky. So this blue outline here, um, it's been referred to either as a tank or a hummingbird, depending on uh, what you want to see there. Um, there's also the, the kilodegree survey. And then I should also point out this Y3, that means the observations taken through the first three years of observations. Uh, but there's actually six years of observations in total, which are, that's being analyzed now. And now the kilodegree survey um, is comprised of these two orange chunks here. Um, and then their latest data set is called 1000 because it's about 1000 square degrees. Now the hypersuprime chem survey, which is not, uh, in our paper we don't combine the HSC results uh, with the DES and KIDS results um, for the reason that, as you can see here, the HSC survey footprint, except for these small fields up here, they're very much overlapping both DES and KIDS, and so there's a very complicated covariance matrix between, um, that we would need to fully understand, which that could be probably somebody else's um, master's project or, you know, something like that. 
uh, to understand the, the correlation between and, and the, the cross covariance between these different data sets. Um, but we do, we, we did work with uh, the HSC team to produce some results um, using a pipeline that we developed and applying it to their most recent results. Um, and here are some, some stats. Uh, they're, they're really complementary. Um, DES is the largest, but uh, it has the smallest number density of source galaxies. And then KIDS also has the benefit of multiple bands, uh, like filters. It goes out to near infrared, and so it has better, like more accurate photometric redshifts. And then finally, HSC just has like really amazing uh, seeing. And so the, the number density is really great, and it's, it's terrific for, for lensing. Um, although, on the other hand, it is much smaller field. All right, uh, so I'm just gonna show you the results um, and not go into too much detail. Uh, but what we did was um, combine uh, DESY3 and KIDS, so that's this pink contour here, and then the original um, KIDS and DES results are here with one caveat, which is that we devised a particular pipeline which we call the hybrid pipeline, choosing between different um, analysis choices that the different surveys conducted for their published results. So there's a little bit of difference from the actual published results, uh, both for kids and DES here, because these are the results using a hybrid pipeline, which um, we did a huge mock analysis testing how different choices affected the, the end result on a, on a mock or a simulated data vector. Um, so we were really looking at how things like changing our intrinsic alignments model, uh, which is one particular systematic for lensing, since we're assuming with lensing that all the objects in the sky that we're using are oriented randomly. Uh, but actually, as we know, there's galaxy formation and um, they behave uh, relative to one another in ways that causes some sort of um, gravitational uh, tidal forces where they're actually uh, become uh, oriented in a particular way. Um, and then there are many other uh, things that we were considering. Um, but the bottom line here is that when we run our hybrid pipeline on the combined DES Y3 and KIDS 1000 data vector, um, we get a 2% uh, precision on this S8 parameter. And um, it's a little bit less in tension with Planck um, than KIDS was by itself, and a little bit more than uh, DES was by itself, although the I should mention the published DS result is kind of closer to two sigma. Um, so we have seen a lot of recent large scale structure or lensing surveys come up with this like kind of two sigma difference from, from Planck. And that, that's, that was one of the main reasons why we were interested in combining, you know, looking at the combined statistical power of our measurement. Um, so that uh, was the takeaway. Um, I think I said this already, so 2% precision on S8, and then the, the model seems to fit very well. Um, now this is what it looks like in, in one dimension, and I just wanted to show this because this makes it very clear that all three of these surveys, and there's two different types of measurements uh, for HSC, so that's why we have these two rows here. All of them, I mean, it's still kind of interesting because they're all on the left side of the Planck value, but we, we think that it, it is less than a two sigma difference. And so, you know, whether that really motivates you to look for new physics to, to explain that, that's it's kind of up to you. But um, I, I think the upcoming data sets will help to reveal more about that story. All right, so looking forward um, from kids plus DES, uh, the more statistical power, the more systematics we learn about, um, and then I, I kind of didn't really go into any of these details, but one thing I wanted you to take away is that a lot of the things that um, we worry about for these lensing cosmology analyses, um, so there we call them, for example, astrophysical systematics, like intrinsic alignments, which I mentioned about earlier. We also care about the impact of baryonic physics. So all of these, you know, one person systematics is someone else's treasure, and of course, we're learning a lot about um, galaxy formation and evolution through JWST and previously through HST and many other surveys. Um, so there's a lot of synergy in that area, I think, where 
JWST is revealing a lot about these things, which, I mean, we, I find them interesting both <laughs> from a systematics perspective and from the galaxy evolution perspective. But I, I think that's one particularly promising synergy. And the last thing I will point out here is that this work builds off of the releases of all three of these collaborations. So highly encourage you to go check out. Um, so each of these surveys have their own sort of webinar summarizing the main results. So you might find that useful. All right, and then I said I would say something about JWST weak lensing so far. So there's not much that I'm aware of, but there is this one paper um, by Finner et al., uh, which conducted a weak lensing analysis of this, the ERO image. Uh, of, of course, we can see tons of strong lensing here, so there's a lot of strong lensing results uh, from this uh, early release observation. But as far as I can tell, this is the first and maybe only weak lensing uh, analysis yet, so happy to hear if people in the audience know of, of other, other ones that exist so far. Um, but there is, we, as we've heard earlier in the conference, there's many more results to come with Cosmos Web, and I think as contiguous area builds up in other fields, we will also be able to do weak lensing here. And that includes weak lensing, not just the cosmic shear, so the lensing by large scale structure I've been talking about, but weak lensing like this result um, behind massive clusters or massive groups, um, even weak lensing by galaxies, so galaxy-galaxy lensing. All right, so sort of the last main section, I wanted to go back and talk about how we're preparing for Roman, um, and this is telling us about um, the process by which we go from light coming from the distant galaxy as it propagates through the universe, and then we will observe it with Roman, and then, of course, we won't have to deal with the atmosphere, but other surveys do, like uh, Rubin Observatory, um, and then ignore the telescope optics, that's probably outdated, maybe for Hubble. And then, finally, we'll receive the light on detectors, um, and we won't receive this light, uh, we will receive this light. Um, and so actually, we are calibrating our point spread function typically on bright stars. And so what we do is try to model how different this image is from what we would expect a point light source to look like in order to calibrate the shape measurement of galaxies. All right, and then um, I'm gonna very briefly talk about some effects that happen in the detectors. Uh, so there's uh, quantum yield, charge diffusion, brighter, fatter effect. So these are some effects that can cause um, some sort of like spreading effect uh, in, of the images. And then I will not talk about these, but these are also super interesting um, detector effects, which we will need to account for in various data in the future. And then these are some um, aspects of nonlinearity, which also contribute that we do need to include in our models. And I'll talk a little bit about the important ones in the next slide. All right, so we need to know our point spread function for Roman really, really well. Um, we need to know it within like less than 0.1% um, in terms of the, sh the shape and size. Um, and then, as I said, because these models are typically based on um, measurements of stars, uh, we need to characterize and understand like all of the detector effects and also telescope effects. I mean, there's, there's many effects that build up here. Um, but the exciting thing is that we have all of the 18 detectors installed in the focal plane, and they've, there's a lot of test data that already exists um, from Detector Characterization Lab at Goddard, and also there's more WFI-level data that will be acquired starting um, in a few months. But the really interesting thing is that the non-destructive read capability of these IR detectors enables correlation functions not just as a function of space, spatial position, but also as a function of time, and we can use that to understand nonlinearities. All right, so just wanted to give a quick shout out to my collaborators, uh, Jenna Freudenberg, Jamor Givens, Anna Poradon, and Chris Arada, and there's also invaluable contributions from the DCL at Goddard, um, and in general, this detector working group, um, and then broader collabor collaborators in our previous science investigation team. All right, so brighter, fatter effect. So this is um, happening because of um, kind of as the electric electrons build up in a pixel's well, uh, there's self-repulsion, and so it's less, it's 
more likely that an incoming photon, if it's already coming into a well that's very full of other electrons, will kind of be uh, repulsed out to the near, nearby neighbor. And then interpixel capacitance is a crosstalk, which is described as a parasitic capacitance because you have these, each of these pixels are connected to the readout with this indium bump. And so there's kind of um, direct, uh, they're all kind of listening to their nearest neighbors in terms of the signal. Um, and then I'll maybe for time skip over classical nonlinearity, but that's pretty standard. Um, and there's a bunch of papers that you can look at um, for more information. And then um, we've been making maps based on our correlation function analysis of some of the detector effects. So this bottom row is the charge diffusion, which is modeled as a Gaussian. So these are covariance matrix elements for that Gaussian. Um, and then this top left panel describes the, the quantum yield. Um, and then, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll skip through this, but it's just to say that we are making maps, um, and I should say what, at least what these axes are. So this is as a function of X position and Y position where we have divided up our 4K by 4K detectors into groups of, groupings of 128 by 128 pixels. So those can be used as inputs to image simulations um, to, to make some sort of realistic uh, idea of what the actual galaxies will look like and allow us to test um, things like shape measurement algorithms, test different strategies for observations, like different dither strategies, um, and a lot more. Um, and this is an example here from the image simulation where uh, just blowing up a group of galaxies where in Rubin Observatory, uh, these would show up as blended galaxies. Um, but the, the basis for this is also um, the same as used for uh, some recent Rubin Observatory Dark Energy Survey Collaboration um, simulations. And so we can kind of do this comparison between how Rubin would see it and how Roman will see it. All right, so just some last thoughts on syner synergies uh, with J JWST and Roman. Um, so I think Roman will benefit a lot from lessons learned from JWST detector test data. Um, and also the on-sky cal calibration and everything that they're, um, that we are learning from um, the, yeah, pr previously the commissioning and just uh, on-sky data, which is helping us develop a better understanding of the PSF from JWST. Um, and then it's also, of course, uh, as mentioned earlier, really revolutionizing our understanding of galaxy formation and evolution, um, and that will help us also understand our system systematics in, in some sense. Um, and then there are lots of future cross correlations and overlapping fields. So one thing is a galaxy galaxy lensing where the interesting selection of objects is in JWST, um, but we actually are measuring the lensing from Roman. So they, these would need to be overlapping fields, but you could even think about JWST or HST snapshots um, and then have make sure you have Roman coverage of a, a wider area. I think that's quite exciting. Um, and I'll, so just say for this plot that this is showing other, um, uh, at the sim similar time experiments going on, so Rubin, LSST, and Euclid, and they're all quite complementary in terms of the wavelength coverage and depth. All right, um, and yeah, maybe I'll just skip here to my overall summary since I've run out of time. Um, but yeah, we're, we've been doing a lot of work mostly from ground-based surveys on cosmic shear, and so currently we're at a 2% precision on this parameter S8. Um, currently, it, it doesn't really seem to be particularly inconsistent with Planck, um, but we're also excited about the upcoming results from JWST. Um, and then finally, we'll be using a lot of the detector test data to understand the systematics ahead of Roman. Um, so I'm really excited about what's to come. Thanks. Okay. We have time for just one or two questions. And I'll, can I have the next speaker, uh, Jung Wan? Come on, and we'll get you set up. Any questions online? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm, well, I'm curious if there's particular parts of the PSF you care about more than others. Like, do you care about the core of the PSF more than the diffraction spikes? Or is, do you just need the whole thing to be characterized to less than 0.1%? Got to some Yeah, I, I mean, I guess we need the whole thing to be 
characterized for things like diffraction spikes. Um, I mean, we can probably avoid using stars that have diffraction spikes for measuring, for modeling the, the, um, the PSF, or be able to maybe model the diffraction spikes well enough to, um, to yeah, mostly be focusing on the, the core of the PSF. Yeah, but it, it is important actually to know, like, yeah, all, all aspects of it, <laughs> both the size and shape. Hey. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. So I'm curious about your last slide, so you're skipping. Uh, I see some, you know, other parameters that we can constrain, and I know there are some, you know, dark matter, uh, sorry, dark energy related tensions. Can you see more about, like, how we can solve these problems? What was the last part? I mean, the... I, I know there are some, you know, tensions in like, W0 and WA com when compare, I mean, comparing the CMB results and some other um, measurements, or maybe it's not. But I, I mean, j just more. I, I wonder, like, more information. Can you comment? Sure. More on yeah. This I, oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, these plots are specifically now in the parameter space of dark energy, and so there's um, this, this is the equation of state in particular, which is relating the density to the pressure. If we think of dark energy as a collisionless fluid, um, so that's if there is no redshift evolution, then um, we just have this W naught. And then this is also trying to place some constraint on the redshift evolution of it. So I'm actually not aware of any in W space tension with CMB. I think it's only in potentially the large scale structure space and in H naught, of course. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah, not, I don't have any particular words for that, although I do know, uh, say, like early dark energy is, is a common theory which people have said helps to, to resolve these tensions. That might be something to, to stay tuned to. Um, but yeah, the important thing here is the different um, types of observations going into the plot on the left. So you can see, so I've been really only talking about weak lensing, uh, but we can, uh, I, I did mention galaxy clustering. So weak lensing of, uh, like galaxy, galaxy lensing, cosmic shear, and clustering, that, that's the three by two. Um, and then you can think about adding all these other large scale structure probes. And those really should give us, you know, different types of systematics and kind of canceled out, or not canceled out, but a different view, which, you know, they, they hopefully don't have all their systematics in common. So we should really be getting a, a better understanding that way. Yeah. Great. Let's thank Amy again. Uh, Ami? Sorry. Great. And if you have any other questions, let's take them to Slack. Um, so our next speaker is Jungwon Park, who will be talking about population three protostar variability. Now, John Wong is going to start his uh, talk. Uh, uh, micro test? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for giving me a chance to give a talk here. Uh, my name is John Wong Park. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland College Park, and I'm working with Professor Massimo Ricori, and I'm collaborating with uh, Professor Kazuki Sugimura at Hokkaido University. And today I'm going to talk about uh, a feature that might have that might be seen by the JWST and Roman Space Telescope. So what is pop three stars? So pop three stars are matter free or extremely matter poor stars, uh, and they were present in the early universe. And because of their large genes mass, they are thought to be very massive with masses like around 100 solar masses. Then why should we study pop three stars? So pop three stars uh, are critical in many aspects, such as the formation of burst galaxies, uh, black holes, and pair instability supernovas. First, they play crucial roles in the formation of the first galaxies. So they produce heavy elements that, uh, that are needed for the formation of the second generation stars and first stars, uh, like 
uh, like the figure seen, uh, here. And the formation of the second generation stars are regulated by the radiated feedback and explosion uh, of population three stars. And pop three stars are massive, so they may leave massive stellar mass black holes. At the same time, gravitational wave detections, gravitational wave radiation detected by Borgo and LIGO, uh, implies that uh, these radiations were made by a merger of black holes with total mass of the 60 solar masses. So this implies that uh, these gravitational waves might have, might have primordial origins like pop three stars. Finally, some pop three stars may explode as pair instability supernovas. And these explosions can be detected by the JWST and Roman even at high redshifts. So yes, pop three stars are important. So to study pop three stars, uh, we performed high resolution computer simulations. Uh, we make use of hydrodynamics called Ramses. And actually we implemented a lot of new physics, but I'm not, not gonna explain all the technical details here. And with our simulations, we have found that uh, the formation of pop three binaries is common. So it, uh, this figure shows the gas density, gas density of one of our simulations. So if you look at the middle panel, there are two binaries uh, orbiting each other. So this is actually a hierarchical binary, binaries of binaries. And each, thing, uh, each circle represents a single particle. And here we assume the single particle is a single pop three stars, but actually they can be a, they can be a, a close binary with a separation smaller than the resolution of our simulations. But just we will assume that they are single pop three stars. And both the left and right panels show the individual uh, binaries more clearly. And we found that these pop three star, pop three binaries have actually eccentric orbits. So in, uh, this is the most ex ex extreme case uh, in our simulation suit. And in this case, the minimum separation is around 1000 AU and the maximum separation is 10 times larger with eccentricities around 0 0.8. And other binaries are, all have eccentric binaries, although they are less eccentric than this. And uh, one thing you have to uh, memorize is that uh, each protostars, pop three protostar have circumstellar disk. And uh, this eccentric orbits makes really interesting uh, feature of pop three, uh, pop three binaries. So you remember uh, each protostars have circumstellar disk and like in galaxy merger, like in galaxy merger simulation or uh, real galaxy mergers, when two circumstellar disks get close to each other, there is a tighter interaction between disk, makes the gas accretion onto the stars boosted. And according to our, uh, according to the radiated feedback model we used in our simulation uh, by Oskar Waito 2010, uh, these massive stars become giant stars. So it means that these stars, these stars get bloated periodically in the eccentric orbit at each pair center. So if these stars get bloated, they cool down, they become faint in UV, but they, bright, they become bright in the optical. So uh, this uh, movie shows what happens in the simulation. So there are two stars, two circumstellar disks, they get close to their tidal interaction, and stars get bloated, and radiated feedback shuts down, and they get they get further away, then radiated feedback begins again. So, uh, if you look at if you look at it one more time, there are two stars. There are two stars, and two stars get bloated. They cool down, and they become faint in UV, and uh, feedback begins again. So this figure shows the accretion rate, accretion rate of two stars, uh, red and green, and the total in black, and the separation between stars as a function of time. And when two stars and two circumstellar disks are far away, uh, for instance, near the epicenter, these two stars, two stars, two protostars are uh, small, smaller inside due to the lower accretion rate, and they are bright in UV. But when they get close to each other, when they close to each other at near pericenter, these stars get bloated, they are faint in UV, and UV photons that 
ionize and hit the gas, uh, the amount of UV photons drops. And this might happen periodically in a binary. And here we converted uh, the lumin uh, luminosity, of, luminosity of binary stars, luminosity of binary stars into two JWST uh, magnitudes. So uh, top panel represents the top panel, top panel shows the, uh, so it traces the rest of frame UV, right, uh, UV magnitude as a function of time, and bottom, bottom represents the rest of frame optical as a function of time. And at pericenter, if you look at this uh, circle, you know, this ellipse, uh, this star become faint in UV, but this star become bright in the optical. And here we assume that this binary star is at the redshift at six. And at the peak brightness, the uh, magnitude in the optical band is around 34 or 35. And one thing that is really interesting is that uh, if you are able to see these binary stars, then we, what we actually see is the light from the photosphere of the stars, not, not the nebular emission line of the surrounding gas, uh, such as helium-2 emission line. And of course, these stars are still too faint to be seen directly. But uh, if this binary is magnified, if the light is magnified by a foreground galaxy cluster like uh, Arundel uh, in the figure on the right-hand side, and if it's magnified uh, enough, then it would be above the detection limit of the JWST and even above the detection limit of Roman. And we are also, uh, so we, are, uh, we are also working on, uh, working on cosmological simulation to estimate the number of pop three stars and the detection rate or pair instability supernovas, uh, for instance, with Roman. Uh, so uh, we are still developing code, and hopefully we can uh, we can present this new results soon. So here is the summary. Uh, we so to study pop three stars, we performed high resolution sim computer simulations, and we found that the formation of eccentric pop three stars is common. And this, uh, in the eccentric orbit, these stars have showed variability. Per period, uh, so they get bloated and they become, they become bright in the optical periodically at pericenter. And if this light is magnified by gravitational lensing, then we may be able to see this variability. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Hey, questions? I actually did have a question, but it's gone. Left my brain. I will ask you it on <laughs> okay, Slack. Okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Any other questions, though? All right, well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And um, the next speaker comes up. Okay, our next speaker is In Tai Jung, who is going to give us a talk about the prospects of mapping ionized bubbles uh, during the epoch of re reionization. You ready? Yeah. Good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is In Tai Jung. Uh, I'm a postdoc here at SCI. <coughs> um, so, so first, uh, thank for the organizing committee and for everyone who made this conference is so exciting. And uh, I'm glad to be part of it. And so today I'm going to talk about the Lyman alpha emitters and uh, the ionized structures around them during the epoch of reionization. 
the, the why why Lyman alpha? So the Lyman alpha is the strongest emission line uh, from the star forming galaxies in the high rich universe, and it, it's also very sensitive to the amount of neutral hydrogen in intergalactic medium. So it can be used as a probe of increasing neutral hydrogen fraction uh, in the intergalactic medium. So at the bottom here, I'm uh, br uh, here I brought a figure from the review paper of Robertson 2022, which shows a compilation of a Lyman alpha constraint on the neutral hydrogen fraction. Uh, so here, particularly, you can see uh, there is a tension between their measurements in the middle uh, phase of reionization. Why do we see such a variation uh, from the measurements? That's because the reionization is inhomogeneous. So here on the top three panels are showing the, the clustered Lyman alpha system at redshifts above seven. So there are multiple uh, observational findings for these clustered Lyman alpha emitters uh, coming from the UV luminous galaxies. So that suggests the reionization process earlier around these UV luminous galaxies, uh, enhancing the Lyman alpha visibility from these galaxies. And this phenomenon is also predicted by the multiple theoretical work. So you can see here, uh, you, you, you expect the enhanced IGM transmission of Lyman alpha with UV luminous galaxies. And uh, one of my latest work, we uh, try to uh, see such a trend from observations based on the statistical sample. So we combine the uh, almost 300 reionization in your galaxies uh, that include the HST Grigium spectra uh, in addition to the Keck, Deimos, and Mosfire observations. So we measure the Lyman alpha equivalent width as a function of UV magnitude uh, at register of six. So the, these red dots are the measurement from our study. And these black symbols are the measurements after reionization. So the equivalent width uh, is decreasing with increasing UV luminosity uh, without IGM trans, uh, attenuation. But into the epoch of reionization, that modulates uh, showing the upturn trend from the, the UV uh, bright galaxies. So uh, the, the ratio, the relative ratio of this uh, equivalent width uh, before and after reionization tells us the relative IGM transmission of Lyman alpha. So you can see here what we got is the boosted IGM transmission of Lyman alpha from UV bright galaxies. So in this simplified cartoon view, you can see here uh, what you're seeing is the, the enhanced Lyman alpha visibility from these UV uh, bright galaxies uh, that are likely to locate in the middle of the large ionized bubbles. So that allows the, the more e easier Lyman alpha escape. So um, now we are uh, studying the IGM uh, topology using uh, Lyman alpha. But why does it matter? So actually, the the evolution of the reionization uh, is imprinted in, in the the reionization topology. So this is the simulation result of the reionization history uh, in uh, from the Tison simulation. But this is the phi model, and at the bottom. Yeah, if that's the case, the, the reionization is led by the, the most uh, mostly faint galaxies. You would expect the earlier reionization and the evolution could be uh, rather smoother. Or the, it's driven by the bright galaxies. You would expect to see the reionization happen more late and the evolution could be patchier. So, patchier. So, the studying this uh, reionization topology uh, allows us to study the history of the reionization and also the source of the reionization, uh, those are the uh, step-forming galaxies. So before uh, JWST, it was uh, sort of limited to study Lyman alpha. That's because the finding Lyman alpha is limited due to the, the, the access for the near infrared rate regime. So the ground-based observations are heavily uh, hindered by the numerous the sky emission lines. But then now uh, with JWST, uh, it's fantastic. So we, we see the Lyman alpha from yeah, 10.6 galaxy and also see extremely high equivalent with Lyman alpha system from uh, at rest 7.3 faint galaxies. And one of the known luminous Lyman alpha emitters turns out to be an uh, Asian at rest 8.7. And with JWST, we now have all the access on the optical spectra of these Lyman alpha systems. So we can do yeah, detailed analysis, uh, which were un uh, undoable before JWST. So it's a very exciting era, and 
in uh, within the Sears collaboration, I led um, detailed analysis of these Lyman alpha emitters uh, with uh, detected in near spec observation. So I analyzed the subset of Lyman alpha target in Sears, uh, which includes three Lyman alpha emitters at ratio to 7.5 to 7.7, uh, 7 uh, and 12 of them are uh, several luminous galaxies, so uh, likely to be the central object of the local overdensity. Yeah, so uh, we have a prism spectra for one galaxy and the medium grading uh, spectra for the letter two targets. By analyzing the emission line properties, so we find these Lyman alpha emitters are you know, relatively metal poor, and which is expected, and also uh, have some high ionization ISM condition. So that's very interesting. And regarding the Lyman alpha, so we compare the Lyman alpha properties between uh, that measured in the JWC near spec uh, with uh, that obtained from Keck MOSFIRE. So by comparing their properties, we find that the spatially varying Lyman alpha properties in terms of Lyman alpha flux and the velocity offset. That's because we are seeing the different spatial reason around these galaxies in between the two observations. And we also perform the, the detailed analysis of uh, the measuring the spatial profile of Lyman alpha uh, from near spec observation. And we find that the spatially extended Lyman alpha line profile compared to the non resonant emission lines. So that's showing the existence of extended Lyman alpha halo. And it's also seen in the deciding redshift 10.6 Lyman alpha emitter. Yeah, lastly, what we did is uh, we estimate the expected size growth of minus bubble around these Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, and in, in this panel, we are showing uh, the horizontal lines, and the horizontal lines represents the size, the one physical megaparsec size of minus bubble, uh, that is the characteristic size to allow this cave of Lyman alpha. So th these measurements are all based on the, the emission line properties obtained from JWST. Um, so the main message and the main conclusion from this uh, analysis is that so in, in general, we need additional sources to create such a large ionized bubble around this Lyman alpha. Or if that's the case, uh, one of the luminous galaxies, if that uh, galaxy has uh, extremely high escape fraction of a Lyman continuum uh, that is uh, suggested by its emission line properties, it, it, it might be able to create its own ionized bubble alone without the support of the neighboring sources. So this is very exciting uh, results. Uh, yeah, uh, that cannot be done in, uh, back without uh, JWST. So, but yeah, there are already multiple other studies uh, doing the, the, uh, the detailed study on Lyman alpha emitters. The first, the JWST keep finding the galaxy of densities with Lyman alpha emitters during the epoch of ionization at different redshifts and different fields of JWST observations. And not just about the findings. So there are multiple studies are doing the detailed analysis. So uh, these works are uh, predicting the size of growth of ionized bubbles uh, depending on the measurement of the escape fraction and uh, analyzing their uh, the, the local over density around this Lyman alpha system. And also, uh, detailed analysis of Lyman alpha transmission can be possible. And one of my latest work, we find that the enhanced uh, Lyman alpha transmission from faint galaxies, particularly when they are located in the backside of a large ionized bubble, because the IGM uh, in the line of sight direction are cleared out by the foreground UV bright galaxies. So that's very exciting results as well. And uh, there are another uh, interesting uh, study come out which shows the episodic increase of Lyman alpha escape with galaxy interaction. So, yeah, now we are we live in very exciting era. We can study Lyman alpha uh, and its surrounding medium uh, in a self consistent way. So we we can estimate the size of growth of Lyman alpha based on uh, JWS observation and also can. Uh, put a constraint on the neutral fraction based on Lyman alpha observation. But then we still need more samples because, yeah, that's the reason why I'm here to talk about this in the, the Roman conference. So this figure is taken from the Astro 2020 white paper. Yeah, in this paper, we, we, we try to convince why we need a large field of view uh, with GMT to study reionization. And now I use the same analogy with uh, Roman. So you can see here. Uh, JWC near spec is too tiny to cover the 
the complex picture of reionization. So uh, beyond the inhomogeneous uh, ionic bubble structures. Oh. oh, yeah. So, yeah, now we see here the footprints of uh, the Roman. Here they can cover larger than the size of the simulation. Um, so the, with deep uh, uh, wide field spectro region spectroscopy, uh, we can reach the line sensitivity uh, 10 to the minus 17 with uh, roughly less than 100 hours of exposure. Uh, that is uh, comparable to the Lyman alpha detected from the luminous galaxies in uh, previous observations. So roughly and conservatively, uh, we can expect more than the 50 uh, luminous Lyman alpha emitters uh, in one field of view. So you know, this is a very rough estimate based on the uh, the known Lyman alpha system in given JWST field. So uh, I'm I'm very benefited from having the the speakers in the morning that prove and that discusses you know, why this Swiss spectroscopic is powerful to find this emission line system and also very pleased to have Isaac Gould after me who can you know, discuss you know, more detailed prediction on Lyman alpha and also the capability of uh, Roman to detect. Uh, this Lyman alpha system during the epoch of reionization. So uh, here I, I can leave my summary. And uh, so the Lyman alpha probed the ionized bubble during the epoch of reionization. And the JWST now uh, provides an access on the field of emission line, uh, which allows us to study the you know, whole bunch of details. And so at, we leave it in a time we can do, you know, the self consistent, uh, we can study reionization in a self consistent way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and but still we need much larger field of view, and Roman has a capability, so yeah, that's the way we can go. And and with Roman, we can collect very nice uh, collection of the Lyman alpha targets, and uh, after this, uh, we can do the follow up JWS observations to do the much detailed study. So yeah, uh, this is the end of my presentation, and take a, I will take a question. Thank you. Questions? I have a question if nobody else has a question. Uh, so this was very exciting. And uh, um, I have, my question is a bit far off because yesterday um, Jenny Green reminded us about all those red dots that we see between redshifts of four and seven. And I'm wondering where were those red dots uh, at earlier times, and could they be one of the merging Lyman alpha emission galaxies? Uh, that's a very interesting question, but I I haven't thought about it. Um, yeah. I don't know if the numbers will match, or but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, thinking about this uh, observing design, so yeah, we can we can accommodate multiple science cases with the same deep uh, observation. So yeah, it's always yeah, the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again. I'm going to Isaac. So our next speaker uh, is Isaac Wold, who will be giving us a tour of the logger survey uh, to study Lyman Alpha at Cosmic Dawn. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good. Okay, great. So thanks for having me. I'm going to be talking about Lyman Alpha emission at Cosmic Dawn. So thank you, Inte, for introducing this topic. And at first, I will be talking about the logger survey, which is a narrowband survey looking for Lyman Alpha emission at a redshift of approximately seven. This is conducted with the pictured telescope, which is the CTIO four meter telescope in Chile. And then I'll be focusing the majority of my talk on the Roman Space Telescope, 
and how we could use the Roma Space Telescope potentially to go beyond redshift of seven and study large populations of Lyman alpha emitters with the near infrared GRISM capability. So, uh, NCA already introduced this, but let me just um, briefly go over this of how we'd like to use Lyman alpha emis emission as as probes of the of the reionization epoch. So, in this cartoon picture of the history of the universe, it, there is the the reionization that's depicted in the center. And what we'd like to do is have samples of Lyman alpha emitters at um, higher and higher redshifts, and as we start to probe into this neutral regime. We expect to see a rapid decline in their number density. Uh, Inte is looking for a rapid decline in the line, the equivalent width strength. But what we are testing for, at least initially within the logger surveys, is looking for a rapid decline in their number density as we start to probe this neutral regime. Lyman alpha is resonantly scattered by any neutral hydrogen that it encounters, making it very sensitive to the ionization state of the intergalactic medium. Okay, so here is my one slide that I'm trying to summarize all the all of Logger. So first off, let me just say that it stands for Lyman Alpha Galaxies in the Epoch of Reionization. At its conclusion, it will cover 24 square degrees, uh, looking for Lyman Alpha emitters at a redshift of 6.9. It makes use of dark energy cameras, uniquely large field of view and detector sensitivity in the near infrared, as well as a custom um, made um, narrow band filter with a central wavelength of 964 nanometers. So our latest logger results, based on the evolution of the, the number densities, places constraints on the neutral hydrogen fraction. And our results are shown by this red bar, which represents the one sigma upper limit uh, constraints from the logger survey. So this is the halfway point of the logger survey based on four out of the planned eight fields. And we're finding this, this neutral hydrogen fraction which suggests a, um, a percentage of 33% or less. So in addition to our own observations, I'm showing uh, different observations from the literature. So these different shaded regions represent the parameter space, which is allowed by the plus or minus one sigma results from the literature. So we find that our result is in general in, in agreement. We also, I'm also showing here some of the uh, some of the reionization models that are that you can find, like these are some of the more extreme reionization models. Um, and so you can see here, our result um, slightly favors a an, an earlier or more gradual reionization scenario, like the the reionization su suggested by Finkelstein et al. in 2019. Within this simulation, you have more numerous low mass galaxies which are driving reionization resulting in an early onset and a very gradual transition from fully neutral to fully ionized. And this can be contrasted to this reionization scenario suggested by Nadu et al. in 2020. Here you have more massive galaxies which are driving reionization, resulting, re resulting in a, a relatively late and rapid transition from fully neutral to fully ionized. So this is the halfway point of the logger survey with the completion of the survey will be able to place even stronger constraints at a redshift of 6.9. We are also interested in, in doing these number density tests, these Lyman alpha number de density tests out to higher redshifts. So you can see that in general, these reionization models, they have the biggest difference at about a redshift of eight. Unfortunately, it's very hard to go out to these high redshifts from the ground, largely due to the increasing night sky background. And so this is where we really like to have a space-based telescope that has a wide field of view and a near-infrared near -infrared capability. And so this is where the Roman Space Telescope can play a major role, potentially. So we all know it has a very wide field of view. It has a near-infrared capability going from about one to two microns, allowing us to study Lyman alpha emitters at redshifts greater than seven. It's above Earth's atmosphere, so we can avoid this forest of bright skylines and continuously track the redshift coverage of, of Lyman alpha emitters. And our initial Roman simulations, which will be the topic of the rest of this talk, show that about a 70-hour GRISM survey can reach line depths comparable to the deepest ground-based surveys at a redshift of seven, which is what we'd like to have as a baseline to study the, the number density evolution and constrain the neutral hydrogen fraction. So here's a slide that sets up these simulations. So this is a 
precursor to what Austin presented earlier today. So it, these simulations do not capture all of the field of view dependencies that Austin's um, simulations are capturing, but they are meant to capture the key characteristics that will allow us to model all the spectral overlaps. And so, like Austin's simulation, we are starting off from actual observations of the cosmos field. So this is showing the H-band Hubble um, cosmos field. For the objects within the field of view, we have morphological and, and, and spectral constraints allowing us to simulate both direct and GRISM images. So here I'm showing two different GRISM images with different position angles. We're assuming that any GRISM deep field will be observed in multiple position angles and that we can use this additional information from multiple position angles to help disentangle all the overlap in spectra. So uh, on the far uh, right here, I'm just showing some of the, the setups for the um, this deep survey that we're simulating. So it has a total of 25 different um, position angles, each with 10 kiloseconds, giving us a total exposure time of about 70 hours. We are assuming a background level of 0.8 counts per second per pixel. With these initial simulations, we have simulated up to a single chip's field of view, but these simulations that I'm presenting today are based on a fourth of a Roman chip, so about 14 arc minutes squared. We are simulating all sources brighter than 25.5 AB. We are assuming a Hubble H-band PSF. We are using the Hubble tool AxiSim to make these, uh, these first generation simulations. We are simulating not only the science order, but the in-focus off orders, which are the 00, zero and the 22 order spectra. Within these simulations, we have continuum sources, we have foreground emission line sources, and we have simulated Lyman alpha emitters with, uh, that span a range of brightshift and flux that we're interested in trying to recover. So the, uh, given this realistic extragalactic field, we want to characterize our ability to recover these objects. So we are going to employ a reduction strategy to look for these Lyman alpha emitters, which takes advantage of all the different position angles that a deep field may have. So our simulations have 25 different position angles. And here I'm, I'm highlighting three sources. So here are three relatively bright sources. You can see in this um, position angle, the red and green sources overlap. But in general, if you were to just select a position angle at random, the same type of overlap will not occur. We can use this additional information to help disentangle what's going on. And so the re reduction strategy that we're using was previously employed on galaxism data. It forms, it takes all these different position angles and forms the data cube. So to look at this in more detail, let's zoom in to this small 10 arc second by 10 arc second region. So on the, on the left, I'm showing a direct image just to show that there's, there's multiple objects within this field of view. And then on the right, we're cycling through a wavelength range of 1.27 to 1.28. And as we cycle through, you can see that the object that is conveniently circled in red has an emission line feature at a wavelength of 1.277 microns. This corresponds to Lyman alpha emission at a redshift of 9.5. So as I said before, this is, this is a reduction strategy that has been employed previously on galaxism data looking for Lyman alpha emitters at, at very low redshifts, at redshifts of 0.3 and 0.9. One of the main advantages for our science is that it is a blind search for, for emission line objects. So we want to be able to compare a Roman sample to narrow band samples, which have also not been pre-selected based on continuum detection. So once we have the final data cube in hand, we page through the wavelength slices and we characterize our ability to recover Lyman alpha emitters as a function of redshift and line flux. And so this is shown on the left. The right is showing the same thing, but the x-axis is changed to line luminosity. So focusing on the left first, you can see that the flux completeness falls off at a redshift of, of 7.5. And this is just due to the GRISM response function, which starts to fall off at about a micron. If we Instead, look at the recovery fraction of Lyman alpha emitters as a function of line luminosity. You can see that there's the reduced cosmological dimming at a redshift of, of 7.5, which, which partially makes up for the declining um, Grissom response function, allowing us to detect Lyman alpha emitters at about a redshift, a, a, loop, a line luminosity of about um, 10 to the 43 or greater. 
So this is a promising result. It is comparable to the deepest ground-based surveys that are redshift to seven and gives us hope that we can use a, 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 a roaming grism deep field to constrain the evolution of the number density of Lyman alpha meters. So as a, a final uh, few slides, what I'd like to point out is that we know that Lyman alpha meters at these redshifts and at these luminosities exist. But these surveys, the current surveys, either are pre-selected based on their continuum or they are over a relatively small volume. And so we really need the volume that we can obtain with Roman to constrain how their number density is evolving. And I'd just like to highlight this, this object here. Um, this is discovered within the GRISM, within uh, HST GRISM survey, the FIG survey, which was preceded by other um, Hubble GRISM surveys, also named after fruits. Um, the uh, grapes and pear survey, which really pioneered the deep GRISM surveys with Hubble. Okay, and then, uh, okay, so another thing I'd like to highlight is what was, up until recently, the highest redshift Lyman alpha emitter known. This is a, a Lyman alpha emitter at a redshift of 8.7. It has a, it is a very luminous Lyman alpha emitter, so we would expect to detect an object like this within our simulations. Um, and now, you know, this was also shown a few times in Inte's talk. This is, you know, changing on a weekly basis, it feels like, with James Webb, but this is now the current high redshift Lyman alpha emitter at a redshift of 10.6. It is admittedly slightly fainter than what we'd expect to detect with our GRISM survey. But what's really interesting about this to me is that if you look at the reionization models, most of them predict almost 100% neutral hydrogen fraction at a redshift of 10.6. And yet, we're finding that Lyman alpha emission is able to escape. And so I think it will be very interesting to see what we discover when we look for Lyman alpha emission with such a large volume that Roman can provide. Okay, so here's my, my summary, and I'll stop here and take any questions. Questions? Anybody else? No? This is so far afield from what I think about. I cannot generate a question on the fly. So, oh, sorry. but but Andrea can. Well, <laughs> uh, maybe. So uh, this morning, Jasleen made a very compelling um, argument for the need for multi orients to both uh, get rid of contaminants and look at structures. Yeah. Um, have you done any trace studies? And what what do you what can you tell us about multiple orients? Yeah. Yeah, so our reduction strategy is, uh, you know, assumes that we have a position angle rich um, data set to draw from. And so uh, we have looked at, given our reduction strategy, how many position angles we can get away with, and it's on the order of 15 for this specific type. So um, we are a huge proponent of multiple position angles to help disentangle overlapping spectra. Have the next speaker come up and we'll get you set up while we answer the last question. Oh, thank you for the talk. So, yeah. Hey. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but but you are able to draw some uh, line sensitivity uh, from the given observing strategy from your test. So mm -hmm. is that comparable to what's been listed in uh, in Roman's website? Yeah, so we've looked at that. And so, you know, what we are doing is trying to go a little bit above and beyond the standard exposure time calculator in that we are throwing in all of this foreground contamination. And so, that, you know, this gives us a lot higher background. And so if you take into account the, the background and the way in which we're reducing the data, which is, you know, forming this data cube, which is, is not lossless, we are, we, like back of the envelope, we are comparable, but um, it is not a, a lossless um, uh, procedure that we're doing here. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Thank the speaker one last time. Last talk of the conference will be given by uh, Harry. Harry. Ferguson, uh, which will be talking about the lessons we can learn from JWST when it comes to doing our data processing. Great, and um, let me just also echo the thanks that uh, other speakers have given to the organizers of the conference. It's been quite enlightening and um, invigorating. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, mostly just about data and, and in fairly general ways. Um, this picture at the top is uh, a piece of the Sears early release observations from JWST, and if the animation works um, on the same scale, is the Roman field of view. Um, and so we get a huge amount of data very quickly, as people have said, um, and so we need to think about that. Uh, it is nice to have a test mission in orbit that we can test out all our data processing on. Um, the near cam detectors are very similar to the Roman WFI detectors. Um, the pipeline that we're developing here at the Institute is based on the JWST pipeline. Some of the people are involved uh, in both missions even now, you know, splitting their time. But we should be aware that many are not, <laughs> and there will be new people coming online and so on. So knowledge transfer is definitely not automatic, and we should be thinking about it now. Um, in, in my collaborations and things like that, the 90-day the limit of slack is becoming a very serious <laughs> impediment to knowledge transfer. <laughs> um, so an outline of my talk, um, a brief summary of the data processing. Um, JWST, I'll just try to put a few highlights from my own personal thoughts on what worked well, challenges in processing near cam data, um, what could have worked better, and then just a few recommendations at the end. Where I'm coming from on this, um, I've been doing deep high latitude observations since the early days of the Hubble Deep Field, successive generations uh, of surveys with HST and other observatories. And um, a lot of them very um, cross science, so they're optimized not for one science objective but multiple, which is very much in the spirit of Roman um, public data and uh, trying to cover, air, you know, get area and depth at the same time. So a lot of synergy with what we're trying to do with Roman. I've had various roles on JWST over the years with at the Institute, serving as the deputy project scientist, as the web instrument team lead, and as data analysis tools branch lead. And so some of the successes and failures, you know, I, are on my head or whatever. Um, but I'm not, I haven't been um, in the functional role on JWST for a few years. So I'm really now coming at JWST as a user, um, really almost as an external user. And I, I'm now in a functional role on Roman and have to think and, and have nightmares about how to deal with all this data as the project scientist for the data management system. Um, just a brief summary, we have a pipeline that has different levels from going from formatted data at the level one, um, to uh, just doing the instrument signature removal and basic calibrations on individual images and then combining them into, um, you know, your multiple dithers or so on into a um, rectified uh, image, which is the level that most people uh, would like to deal with, but not everybody, of course. Um, and then level four um, for Roman is, um, think of that as source catalogs. Um, and it's not something that we, uh, really construct, we do construct source catalogs for JWST, but they're really for aligning images. They're not really intended for um, the, you know, science analysis. Um, so there's the, just the level two pipeline flow of the basic uh, calibrations and things. So what worked well? So um, before I go to the next slide, um, I was reminded of a wonderful book by um, Norman Augustine, who was, um, he was an undersecretary of the Army, but he was also actually the CEO of Lockheed Martin, which is responsible for a lot of <laughs> space astronomy missions. Um, and um, he wrote this book uh, based on his many decades of experience in the military industrial complex of building large expensive things. And so he has a bunch of data analysis of how development works in practice, and then these laws he derives from them. So one of the laws is uh, it's extremely expensive to uh, develop a high level of unreliability and a factor of 10 increase in cost 
usually results in a factor of 10 decrease in reliability. Um, another of his laws, uh, just looking at the success of things, is that 90% uh, of the time things go worse than you expect, and the other 10% of the time you had no right to expect so much. So many of us involved in JWST were, our expectations <laughs> were, uh, uh, that something would go wrong. I mean, we didn't know what would go wrong, but something this complex, uh, it's unlikely that things uh, would go swimmingly. And um, in some sense, it's stunning that things went well. That's the HST image of the early release. This is the JWST image. So the, the first uh, images were just stunning. The first uh, sort of data analysis from those were stunning. Um, the commissioning completed essentially on schedule. The data release was essentially on schedule. The archive opened. Um, we had spectra of high redshift galaxies uh, in these early release observations that, um, you know, for people interested in this kind of, this era, that's exactly what we were, you know, sort of promised for JWST, and we're seeing it on the first day of uh, science release. So the timeline, so the ERO observations were sort of processed from June 3rd to July 10th. The pipeline and archive were up and running. The, um, the July 12th, the ERO observations were released. There were 62 preprints on the preprint server by August 14th, so within a month, the community had done quite a lot of analysis. Um, the Sears program that I'm involved in, the data became available, was actually taken before the archive uh, was open to the public, became available to the team on July 12th, and papers from independent groups uh, appeared on the archive within within a couple weeks. Um, so what worked? Well, I, th I think the huge investment in engineering from NASA, while it wasn't foreordained that that would work, given past experience, it did work um, and resulted in an observatory that deployed and you know worked pretty much flawlessly. Um, lots of testing pre-launch helped a little bit by launch delays uh, to get end-to-end -end testing of the archive and pipelines and things like that so that those could work reliably. Um, data formats and interfaces, that's why you do the sort of end-to-end -end testing. You're always debugging that kind of thing, um, and you don't want to be doing that when you're in orbit and waiting to do science. Commissioning worked amazingly well. Immediate release of public data after commissioning, I think, was a... Um, extremely beneficial to the uh, to science and to the observatory. Um, I think the modular pipeline architecture was useful. Um, I'm probably too close to it to know how useful it was, but um, I, having written as a user, pipeline modules found it reasonably easy to do that. Um, uh, community participation, um, preparation, I think, uh, helped again a little bit by launch delays, but the instrument development teams were in place since 2002, so a lot of people have been thinking about this for a long, long time uh, and had a lot of expertise. The early release science teams since 2008, we had this series of webinars to get people up to speed on pipelines and tools and proposal tools and things like that. There was a detailed exposure time calculator, a, a bit complex to use for a new user, but um, certainly beneficial. Uh, nonetheless, there were and are challenges. Um, so uh, there are various near-cam processing issues um, that are sort of ongoing but sort of hit us from day one. Um, there's uh, a bias drifts in these detectors uh, that results in pattern noise that uh, we have mitigation strategies, but we don't have complete removal strategies. There are cosmic ray, snowball artifacts, image registration, scattered light, background subtraction, flat field. I'll show a few examples. Here's the one over F noise. You can see um, pre-removal. You can see stripes. Um, they're sort of stripes removed, and you can beat it down. The, the current approach, at least we're using in Sears, is essentially to fit lines with constant levels having masked out sources. There's definitely better approaches treating it as a 1D time series, um, but the, as far as I know, they haven't been implemented in any um, usable pipeline. Um, the snowball, snowballs are cosmic rays, big cosmic ray events that leave um, multiple pixel uh, residuals because the, the center is masked, but they have enough uh, low level flux in the outskirts that you see these sort of donut holes. Um, and uh, several people in the community uh, had, you know, very rapidly developed 
uh, ways to mask this a little better than the Institute pipeline, and then the Institute has also developed a, a routine to do that, and so you can, you know, improve um, that sort of artifact removal. One thing that isn't yet uh, treated in any pipeline that I'm aware of is that snowballs, if they're bright enough, they leave persistence. So this is one image. This is the next dither. That persistence is in the same place on the detector, but because it's a dither, it's a different place on the sky. And it looks like a galaxy, and um, some of my colleagues were ready to write a paper on a very bright emission line source before we probed back uh, to find it in the uh, original data. Um, so um, th that kind of thing, that kind of subtle persistence um, can be uh, something to worry about. There's less subtle persistence we had in Sears. Um, observations of Jupiter happen right before um, that, you know, hit us, but those are pretty obvious. <laughs> uh, there's scattered light that is also pretty obvious in some data um, and results in, in a wisp-like feature. Um, that Making a template of that is somewhat successful, but not completely successful at removing it. And so that's actually a fairly major source of sky background fluctuations that uh, we don't yet have a good solution for beating down. Um, and then, so after that, even after that wisp removal, you're left with various levels of background that has quite a lot of structure in it. Um, I have personally spent way too much time on coming up with algorithms to beat this down. Iterative approaches sort of work, but um, they do oversubtract the wings of large galaxies. Um, so this is the what the you're essentially if you say, okay, I'm going to use um, uh, block averaged or block summed image. Uh, on different scales to predict what the pixel-to-pixel -pixel fl noise fluctuations would be if it were white noise. Um, this is what you see because the sky background is fluctuating and it's not white noise. Um, that's what you see before background removal, and then the background removal beats this down so that you're hitting the right noise. Um, and basically by choice on Sears, we beat it down to be flat at scales larger than about one and a half arc seconds. So when galaxies bigger than that, we are definitely over subtracting, but we're primarily looking for faint high redshift galaxies and want to find them in the wings of big bright galaxies. Um, flat fields are still a work in progress. For the NGD pro, um, uh, program, we're not yet reaching the depths that we had hoped. Um, probably because of flat fields, we haven't actually nailed that entirely. Um, but the flats that were available a few months ago were definitely uh, not good enough. We made a whole set of, Gene Lung made a whole set of uh, sky flats from all the available data. Um, in the meantime, the Institute has made new flats and things have improved a lot, but we're still not in some bands reaching the depth. Um, running out of time here, a uh, quick tale of two galaxies um, that reveal some of the early things talking about the first two weeks of a science release, two galaxies found at very interesting redshifts, 1416, not expected. A um, couple weeks later, uh, our team realized that our registration of some of the images in F150W was not perfect. This redshift then came down to around 11 and a half. Um, this Several teams had different photometric redshift distributions with different secondary peaks. Um, director's discretionary time spectra got spectra of both these, which were right next to each other in the sky. Uh, the redshift 16 comes out at redshift 4.9, and the, red, the second photometric redshift estimate for um, this redshift 11 and a half galaxy turned out to be just about spot on. Um, so, you know, spectra are great, <laughs> but it's also uh, early data reduction challenges um, meant that a lot of papers that were put out there um, had very tentative results. Uh, things that could have gone better. Um, communication, so between the institute and the community in both directions, kinds of questions the community wants to ask, like who's the expert? Who should I talk to if I really want to dig into this? That's often very difficult to find. Um, Help desk is, you know, the starting point, but that doesn't that doesn't get you somebody necessarily who knows, um, you know, instantly knows the answer. Um, what's the schedule for doing things? We've been, I would say, not as good as we should be on 
publishing the schedules of when we're planning to do something, even if it's tentative. Um, uh, users typically don't know whether there's a bug in the pipeline they should report or if they're doing something wrong. So there's an impediment to reporting things. On the other hand, how can software developers fix something if they don't know it isn't working? So there's a communication gap there that means it's in some, sometimes hard to know um, what's being done and when and set priorities and so on. Um, within the community, teams in general are really sort of sharing only some expertise in code. There's no central discussion forum. Attempts to try to do that haven't really gone anywhere. Um, and so at some level, the biggest problem with communication is, is borne out that it's the illusion that it's taken place. There's, I think, a lot of, that could be improved on general communication. Uh, simulations, so most of the software um, and expertise on simulations for web was in the instrument development teams, considerable expertise there. They had no formal responsibilities for delivering simulators. Um, they did have some responsibilities for simulated data, but the timing was problematic for software development for the pipeline. Um, some of that simulation software is still proprietary. Um, there's, there was very little simulated data available to guide the software development, which we're trying to rectify for Roman. Um, and so um, that, that was always a struggle. Um, pipeline architecture, I think, uh, right now it takes a supercomputer to reduce Sears. So Sears data volume um, of all those filters was 1.2 uh, gigapixels for the coads. That's similar to four filters on Roman uh, for the one field of view. We processed it on the Texas Supercomputing Center. Um, and one iteration, I asked Michaela Bagley if she'd try to do some profiling. Um, the wall clock time was 28 hours to do four of those pointings, so 0.5 gigapixels. Um, and some of those tasks were massively parallel and others weren't. So that wall clock time, you know, reflects some level of parallelization. Um, there are some memory hungry steps. So there's right now some effort to, to try to understand why some of the image registration steps take 500 gigabytes of memory. Um, and it was definitely uh, tricky for users to figure out how to, to tweak this. Missing tools, um, slit overlays still aren't really working. Um, people have rolled their own. Uh, there's no real easy way to drill down to the individual images. You can do it, um, but it's not something that uh, uh, is simple to, to sort of do on the fly. And I think there's still, at least from what I've seen at conferences, still a lot of community trying to figure out what to do with PSFs and doing different things there. Um, and and um, there could be more centralization there. Quick recommendations. I'm sure that everybody here can have their own recommendations from JWC experience. So adopt the good bits of community ex uh, engagement, the webinar kinds of things. I think with the science platform for Roman, we'll also have that bit to uh, get people on there and get early training and usage. Um, have something like the ERS program to get data out uh, quickly. Um, I think it would be very useful to have a more formal lessons learned session uh, between Roman and James Webb, including the instrument team, software developers, data experts. Um, Maybe at the, there will be a JWST calibration workshop probably sometime late in the year. Um, um, maybe that's a good place to do it. Um, I think a fair amount needs to be done to understand, um, it's particularly the pipeline performance on data sets that, you know, the size of Roman, um, and of course address the problems and get them into Roman pipeline. Thank you. Questions? This is a great talk, thank you. Um, given all of this, what scares you the most about Roman? Um, two things. One, I just the sheer volume of data um, is, I don't think we, have yet completely got our hands around, you know, first, you'd like to figure out really what the tall poles are, and I don't think we completely know. So sheer volume, and that volume's gonna hit us on processing, but it's gonna hit the whole community on how you do science. You know, we're, we're, put it, we're putting the data in the cloud, but we've gotta get used to 
you know, bringing the compute to the data. And I don't think we completely understand that yet. Um, and then from the, you know, the core science goals require systematic, treatment of systematics at a level, you know, an order of magnitude better than we are doing for James Webb. And that, that is a challenge to the overall system, so those two. Uh, thanks, Harry. The talk was really great. Um, so you're also part of Rubin, right? And Rubin is also going to deal with a huge chunk of data. So what do you think, uh, is there something from Rubin that could be useful to Rubin? Because, of course, it's on a much more compressed timeline. So do you think there's something that... Yeah, I think there, there's, there's a lot of synergies, um, particularly uh, in the area... The, the data processing is different enough and our pipeline evolution is different enough that there's not a lot of sort of software we can share easily. Um, there are pieces we should probably be sharing. One that uh, um, I would love to make progress on is image displays when your data are, you know, across the country and you want to look at large patches of sky and do that, do the kinds of things we do in DS9 or whatever. I don't think that that's sort of an unsolved problem. Um, but then the other thing is just this, you know, the whole ecosystem of dealing with giant data sets in the cloud, bring your compute to the data and things. We're developing a system here. It's very similar to what Ruben's doing. We are talking to them. Um, but th that level of sharing, I think, I, hopefully will help both, you know, both well, every organization that's making these kinds of platforms <laughs> make them useful. Okay, next question. So uh, I remember the question I, or the thing I was going to say at lunch <laughs> or ask you about. Um, so I've heard that during commissioning for JWST, uh, there was some freezing of software, you know, just so things would keep working the way they worked and wouldn't be breaking all the time. In the normal sort of ecosystem these days in terms of software, Things break a lot of times because they're coming in from everywhere. You know, it's a community sort of driven thing. So how do you best um, insulate or protect pipelines? You know, even if they're the, the not individual people doing it, but on the scale of, of things in the cloud and all this, how do you best insulate from all those effects, which, you know, are things breaking all the time just slow everything down, of course. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a tough problem. I, I, um, so, you know, having, having stable releases uh, with some kind of reasonable schedule that people can plan for, um, I think that is part of the approach. Um, if, that, if the release time scale is like six months or something like that, that's too long for science. So people can't wait that long. So you need something in between that allows people to get the fixes that they care about quickly. And yes, they will have to deal with some level of instability because there's no way to make that perfectly stable. Um, I think with, with open, especially for Roman and JWST, with open development on GitHub where you have, you can grab the develop, today's development version, we do have sort of a solution. You could come up with other ways of getting sort of intermediate minor releases or something, but um, it, you know, it has problems, but I think it's, it, it's fairly workable. <laughs> okay. uh, one more question, and then I think we'll have to push this one to Slack, but I think people have thoughts. We wanna make sure we have time for discussion. Yes, thank you for your talk. Um, I, for the for the more technically driven uh, astronomer here, I have a question that uh, um, it's, I find it really hard to find out uh, which part of the efforts, for example, for pipelines or, or corrections, are being tackled by a space telescope, and which are from are expected to do on your own. So it's like a very thin gray boundary there. That uh, well, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, that comes back to, yes, I completely agree. It's hard, and I'm, I work here, and I don't know. <laughs> I also don't know. Uh, it's, it's very hard to know where the expertise is and what people are doing and what their plans are. 
for releasing it. Um, and and I, I do think we could benefit from some more openness. Um, and I, I actually sort of feel like sometimes we think we're being open and talking to people, and but somebody who isn't in the right room or on the right mailing list or whatever doesn't doesn't know. And so, yeah, it's a communication gap, big one. Okay, so we'll close uh, there. Andrea, do you want to introduce the discussion section? Thank you so much. Yeah. Say that uh, as the chair of the document, co-chair of the documentation effort, we have plans. For Roman, not for Judy Wusti. Thank you, everyone. And I think uh, the last uh, talk has set us up for a discussion session uh, because the question of how um, the community, how you want to interact with the design survey um, is one of the topics. And what your plans are for the data uh, torrent from Roman is also one of the topic of uh, topic of discussion. So as we did on Wednesday, um, the topics are uh, pasted uh, on ver on tables in the cafe. Please walk around and pick the topic you want. Preferably the topic you chose Wednesday so that there's some continuity, but feel free to switch. Please choose someone who will synthesize what your group uh, what your group discussed, and that person will give a one to two minute update at the summary session. Thank you. I'll try to maximize the gallery. I think you stop sharing. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.